Grace and peace be unto you, children of God, from our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know I always thank God on your behalf for His grace, that in all things you're enriched by Him, so you won't be lacking in any gift. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the Master's Touch Masterclass. Now, these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. And if you can't make it at the time of our broadcast, then know that we are archiving these for your study convenience. God bless you richly as we begin to enter God's presence. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your precious presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, flowing through our lips. And we exalt and praise you and your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and Savior, your only Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, the logos word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, amen. My friends, did you come uh, expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. Elevate your expectation level and you'll come away with a greater revelation and a greater heart and mind connection. Now today as we begin a series, um, we're going to begin a series on dying to self. I've had so many requests uh, for this particular kind of series, basically because people say, I don't understand what dying to self means. What does that mean? You know, and this is a whole array of study. <laughs> okay, an area of study. So by studying... Um, what is meant by the phrase we hope to enlighten the believers to the truth of why we must die to self. Before we begin, we must come into the presence of God fully in order to gain understanding of these messages. So let's do that right now. Soak with me. You know, dying to self is the power of Christian living. And the essence of a being's existence has to do with the fact that he is a living reality. If a person no longer has or exhibits the functions of vitality, they're said to be, uh, to no longer exist. All right? So the essence of death is the absence of life. Therefore, when one dies, one ceases to exist. To carry the argument into the spiritual realm, when someone spiritually dies to self, self ceases to exist. That is, self is no longer the reason for one's existence. Now, as such, the individual is no longer concerned with his own will or happiness. 
because he no longer is in the picture. He's no longer the center of his own little universe. He no longer continues to arrange the world around him. Actually, once one realizes that he's died to self, he should realize that to the world he has already died and gone to heaven. In reality, he is only still here waiting for Jesus to bring him his glorified body so he can go on home. The individual who dies to self understands that God created him for a reason, that he is a part of God's plan for the world. Now, to be used of God, one has to understand the essence of who he now really is and how it is that God can use him. Every genuine child of God wants to be used by God to accomplish his purposes in the world. And Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. John 15, verse 8. That's the essence of God's plan. We are saved to bear fruit, created in Jesus Christ for good works. Ephesians 2.10 So we bear fruit when Christ lives his life in and through us. Evidence, John 15, verse 5, and Galatians 2, verse 20. The Apostle Paul said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Philippians 1, verse 21. Now, do you suppose he was talking about physical death? For me to live is Christ, and for me to die physical death is gain? No. The Lord wants us to live a godly and spiritually productive happy life, my friends. The world's philosophy says live for self, but God's word says die to self. So many people came to Jesus and asked to be his disciples, but most of them turned away because they weren't willing to give themselves to Christ. For example, make themselves a slave of Christ. As recorded for evidence in Luke 14, verse 26 and 33, Luke 16, verse 13, Romans 12, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. Look those up. I'm giving you these scriptures for a reason. Jesus said, He who loves his father or mother or himself more than me, he is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 37 and 30, through 39. Then Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 <clears throat> C.S. Lewis's literary demon character, Screwtape, has something insightful to say on this subject. He tells his young nephew that humans rarely pray for the thing God wants them to pray for. They simply want enough grace to see them through some moment or time of trouble. They conjure up a vision of the future they want and appeal for that outcome. They persist in wrapping their anxious hands around life's steering wheel as if it's going to work this time if only they clutch it more tightly. You know, the most difficult prayer for us to voice is, Not my will, but thine be done. Our conversations with God rarely, or I mean regularly, not rarely, but regularly leapfrog over our intellectual resolve. Not to ask for stuff and land squarely on the bargaining and pleading table. <laughs> the best we seem to be able to do is arrive at a compromise between what we know to be rightly intellectually and the howl of protest that lies within us. I shouldn't say rightly intellectually, it's right intellectually. So, listen, my friends, obedience isn't easy. Sometimes our carnal mind doesn't like the idea of God having his way and, uh, and us having to obey it, okay? It's the nature of man to want things to go his way. Now, when things don't go as we planned, when it rains on our parade, when someone says something unbecoming to us, when our world turns upside down, when difficulties and circumstances tax us too much, when we get turned down for a promotion, when we don't get what we worked so hard to acquire, the long and short of it all is it bothers us deeply. It rubs us the wrong way. It makes us angry. But here's the real rub. Just because we're living a life of obedience doesn't automatically make our situation better. Most believers think that by being, <clears throat> by being obedient, the clouds will go away and the skies will turn to blue. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Their financial problems will, poof, disappear, and their little nest egg will grow again. Their physical infirmities will go away, and their health will once again return. Well, sometimes these things may happen, but at other times they don't. Is God still good? Absolutely. This we will also conclude. Being in God's will is far better than being outside of His will. The secret to a joy-filled life doesn't lie in the absence of, of, or, uh, of pain or in demanding our own way, but in dying to self and embracing God's will. Submission to the will of God in your prayer life may be expressed in words like these. Father, 
You understand my heart, my needs, and my prayer better than I understand them myself. You know that my spiritual needs far outweigh any physical or temporary needs that I may have, and I know that your will, being done in my life, will give meaning, purpose, and fulfillment beyond anything I could ask or understand. Well, okay, let's get down to it. What does it mean to die to self? Jesus described the dying to self process, denying self, as a part of following him. That was what he said, denying self. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then he went on to say that dying to self is actually a positive, not a negative. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, 25. So in dying to self... Uh, into the self-life, actually, we discover an abundant life, and by depending on God, who is our only source of supply and provides much more than we can imagine. Jesus put it this way, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24, and Galatians 5, 22 through 23. So part of the life we discover when we give our lives to Christ is freedom from a life of self-obsession. As such, <clears throat> we experience the joy of Christ and we become more accepting, generous, and loving of others. So when we die to self, we set aside our wants and desires and instead focus on loving God and valuing others as highly as we value ourselves. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. This moves us away from self-centeredness, folks, and more open to being a follower of Christ who cares deeply for others. You know, it's much easier to pay attention to the concerns, interests, and needs of other people, Philippians 2, 3 through 4, when we are no longer obsessed with our own interests. <laughs> However, dying to self is something that we Christians find hard to do. In this world, where there is pressure on all sides to replace the love of God for something lesser, to die to, se to oneself is something that nearly every believer is adverse to doing. Since we live in a world of instant gratification, dying to oneself is a concept that is both foreign and unacceptable. Yet this is one thing that Jesus insisted upon. Essentially, the Christian life is an ongoing process of dying to self and living for Christ, seeking His will and kingdom and righteousness rather than our own. But as fallen humans, we are hardwired to seek our own will above anyone else's. We want our way in life, and we all have a tendency to see things from our point of view and define the world by how we see it. Although most people deny their own self-centeredness, a man, uh, man by nature is very much self-centered and self-interested. And we're not born good or others-oriented. Our fall from grace stemmed from wanting to be like God, Genesis 3.5. As a result of a lot of the aspects of pride that characterized uh, the first man, you know, they also characterize us. Pride keeps us from receiving God's love, so we are so full of ourselves that we are inclined to think that our need for God isn't that great, because we're proud. We chase after other lovers in an effort to please ourselves, and that's the essence of idolatry. Oh yeah, idolatry takes many forms, my friends. A relationship we value more than God, the desire for material wealth, that's greater than our love for God. The desire to draw attention to ourselves rather than directing the attention of others toward God. The world is full of idols that dethrone God from our hearts. Anything that causes one to have a self-focus rather than a God-focus is a form of pride and is ab aberrant to God. The two things that keep us from God and the two main reasons why we need to die to ourselves are pride, self, idolatry, desires, those two things. So the would-be disciple <laughs> must deny himself. That is, he must disregard his own interests and die to the willful, selfish, sinful parts of himself. He must let go of his plans and what he wants to do. The issue of dying to self is a process of stripping away layers of sin encrusted with selfishness. That is, um, uh, and it's an integral part of the process of sanctification, my friends. It was the disciples' natural instinct to preserve their own lives that caused them to flee from Christ at his arrest. But self-preservation results in spiritual loss. As we see in Luke 9, verses 24 through 25. Let's take a look. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? 
The disciples learned that the Christian life is not about us, it's about Christ. It's about putting God's will over our will. It's about putting Christ first above everything else. No matter what it costs us, it's the realization that we are his servants, and as such, our goal is to live for him and glorify him in everything that we say and do. When we came to Christ, we chose to make him our Lord and invited him to come and live in us. In doing so, we chose to give up our will for his. Since we chose to become his child and servant, then we must die to ourselves every day, every hour, every minute, every second. The greatest hope for each of us as believers is to die to self that we might live for Christ. Dying to self is never portrayed in scripture as something optional in the Christian life. As believers, we are to uh, uh, follow Christ. It's our daily cross that makes us weep more than any other thing, that makes us cry out like Jesus, Father, why is this? That causes us to run to Christ and put our arms around him, that makes us sick of earth and self, and that gives us a longing for heaven. Paul said, I die every day, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. So then, the goal of death to self and daily cross-bearing is fellowship with Christ. The goal of life for the believer is to seek God and make him their all in all, their last and final end. Here are five ways as, as suggestions on how that we should embrace the cross. Number one, humiliation. This is the essence of the Christ life. Here God uses reproaches, abuse, poverty, loneliness, persecution, distress, seeming failure, disappointments, and the like. These things succeed when they cause us to lose our own will and let God take charge. Number two, rejecting the praise of men. Self thrives on praise and adulation. Self-esteem is the hotbed of the self-life. Number three, embracing simplicity and childlikeness. Self feeds on things grand and glorious. Child or Christ-likeness. I'm sorry, did I say childlikeness? Yes. Yes, okay. I have to re-look re at this because I thought maybe I wrote the wrong word. Okay. Self feeds on things grand and glorious. Christ-likeness is childlike and simple. All right. Number four, living by pure faith. Self depends on an outward assurance. Living by pure faith trusts the word of God, even when there's no indication of God's presence or blessing. I'm, I can't impress upon you enough that when you live by pure faith, you are skating on thick ice. Self depends on outward assurances and on signs and wonders and manifestations. Living by pure faith trusts the Word of God, trusts God, believes God, not just believes in Him. Okay? Number five, seeking our nothingness and His allness. We must make a daily habit to distrust ourselves, our own wisdom, and our strength, and look to Christ alone for what we need. What does that mean? That means that... <laughs> that means that... Uh, I'm nothing without God. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me, but without Christ, without God, I'm nothing. I can't do anything. So how does one die to self? Well, it's no easy task. Since we're embracing ethics that are foreign to our very nature and are not our own making, okay, they're not of our own making, they belong to Jesus, dying to self more often than not involves a real fight when we try to surrender our will to the will of God. Uh, for your evidence, see Galatians 5.17 and Ephesians 5.12. However, God gives sufficient grace to those who fight the good fight as evidenced in John 15, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, Ephesians 3, verse 16, and Philippians 4, verse 13, Colossians 1, 9 through 11, 1 Timothy 1 through 1, 18, Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, and 1 John 5, verse 4. Um, if you need me to send those to you, I'll be happy to send you all the, the uh, scripture references for your edification and education, and you get to look them up. By the way, we'll never be able to die to ourselves unless we're convinced that serving the flesh, our sin nature, is totally unprofitable. We have to see that it has absolutely no worth. We need to come to detest its very presence. And on the other hand, we must come to love the Spirit's ways because we are to see the glorious work of the Spirit in contrast to the flesh. By seeing their contrasting ways, we will hate one and love the other, Matthew 6, 24. We refuse to serve our own self-preferences and become wholly loyal to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. 
In your quiet moments, talk to God and ask Him to reveal those areas of your life that you need Him to, need to submit to Him. Ask Him for the grace to help you surrender those areas of your life and ask Him for the grace to help you believe and deliver you from your unbelief. Mark 9, verse 24. The truths gleaned from Romans 6 through 8 are critical for establishing a strong Christian life. And why is this? And what truths are powerfully presented here in Romans? Well, Paul applies the pattern of Christ's life to our Christian lives. And in so doing, Paul enables us to get a grasp of this through the picture of baptism. The down and the up of it. You see, bad, baptism doesn't mean you to sprinkle, but it means to immerse. A Christian doesn't merely acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, he also follows Christ. He acknowledges both the value of what Christ has done on the cross and the importance of how Jesus redeemed us. We usually focus on what Christ has accomplished through his death. and Actually, uh, Paul speaks clearly on this in chapters 3 and 4 of Romans. Chapter 5, however, develops the basis of our union with Christ. We are united with Christ by our faith. Starting in chapter 6, we see how this identification with Christ affects our life. The picture of baptism includes three aspects. Number one, the going down. Number two, being under. And three, the rising up. Now we might think of rinsing a cloth. We take it from the air, submerge it under the water, and then bring it up, out, uh, up and out to be used. Humility speaks of the first two steps, and many would like to avoid the implications of these first two very important steps. What they want is to claim to have eternal life with no sense of repentance or dying. They haven't died to themselves. There has been no funeral. This concept is key to living a fulfilled Christian life, my friends, but we seem to have a problem. Paul seems to have discovered a group of people that claim Christ's death but deny any real identification with Christ in the death process. So, according to them, Christ merely paid for their sins as some historical fact, which it was, of course, and past that, they want to forget about their close identification with Christ in the process. Now, if we consider Christ's death to be so all-important, and it is, then we need to realize its effect on our lives. When Jesus died, he not only bore our sins, but he also was, in a final way, saying no to sin. After death, sin had no part of his life. He had no earthly flesh that begged to be given special preference. So we, as his disciples, must identify with Christ's death and resurrection. We must say no to our former allegiance to sin through our faith and yes to our allegiance to Christ. We now have a new focus on life, and because of this new allegiance, we're not to sin, but to live for God. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. Romans 6, verses 10 through 12. So what about pride? Hate it. We will never be able to die to ourselves unless we're convinced that serving the flesh, our old nature, is totally unprofitable. We have to see that our old nature has absolutely no worth at all, and we need to come to detest its very presence. You know, on the other hand, we must come to love the Spirit's ways. We are to see the glorious work of the Spirit in contrast to the flesh. Then, by seeing their contrasting ways, we hate one and love the other. We refuse to serve our own self-preferences and become totally loyal to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Then, of course, that old fiend... Pride comes nosing around. We can't rid ourselves of the flesh on this earth, my friends. I'll say it again. We cannot rid ourselves of the flesh on this earth. This is what Jesus referred to in Romans 6 verse 10 when he says, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. It's still there. If we're not cautious, we'll end up serving it, but we don't have to. By voiding our allegiance to our flesh, we can, by Christ's grace, be set free to serve only Christ. So how do we void our former allegiance to our flesh? Well, Paul says death is the only means, and he explains it very specifically in Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. The point is that unless we are absolutely convinced that the flesh is a destroyer, we will continue to listen to it and follow it. We will, in essence, continue to serve it. Now, as Christians, we are technically free from its rule over us, but we still can fall into serving the old self. So then, the follow-up question is this. Whether we really hate the flesh... Are we really convinced? Paul convincingly set forth his case in the last part of chapter 7 and the early part of chapter 8 in Romans. Whenever he would go by the old nature, he would serve his own self and bear evil results. But he wanted to serve Christ, 
Romans 7, which brings forth the fruit of the Spirit. See Galatians 5 for your evidence. The flesh always brings about death because it's hostile to God. Romans 8. So, we ought to live not for our bodies. See, we don't need to live for ourselves. We need to humble ourselves by stating that serving ourselves is not good. In a sense, this is what's, what dying to self essentially means. We recognize serving self is no good, and so we choose to serve the Spirit. These chapters provide a lot of help in convincing us of the horrible nature of the flesh and the marvelous glory of the Spirit. Capital S. Commitment to saying no to the old nature comes only as much as... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. As much as we are, number one, we're sure of the old nature's total rebellion against God, and number two, we desire to serve the Spirit. You see, our growth comes as we recognize the complete rebellious nature of the flesh and the power of the new life through the life of Jesus. So dying to self means simply a mental check on our determination not to live for oneself <clears throat> and to live only for Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31 says, I die daily. So we can see that this is a regular battle, a daily battle. Paul, as veteran apostle, uh, witnessing many miracles, seeing a revelation of Christ, still had to personally die to himself, and we do too. We quite simply can't afford not to. Here is a possible prayer for your early morning meditation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, my allegiance to you will be tested today. Right now, I'm stating my faithfulness to you. You are the one I love forever. At the same time, I will clearly state that I want nothing to do with serving myself. I have had enough to do with that selfish ego of mine that tries to get all the attention it can. Your principles of love and giving are what I want. Radiate in my life through acts and words of kindness. Forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I make myself totally empty of self so that you can fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. Lead me forth. I will follow your humble paths of love. The Christian needs to acknowledge the flesh, declare its lousy nature, reject its promptings, acknowledge the Lord's presence, acknowledge the beautiful nature of the Spirit, and affirm one's total heart and will to the Spirit's leading. Christian life is based on humble living, my friends. When we are willing to humble ourselves by looking at the facts of what self-service does, then we see that we are willing to walk in that path. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you have questions or need further assistance with understanding the message, please contact me. I'll give you my contact information. Our website, www.themasterstouch.org. That's www.themasterstouch.org. Um, also, you can email me at uh, half a second at Dr. Stephanie, this is on the website now, at Dr. Stephanie um, at themasterstouch.org. That's D-R-S-T-E-F-E-N-I at themasterstouch.org. And that's, when I spell my name S-T-E-F, it's Frank, like Frank, St Stephanie, S-T-E-F like Frank, E, N I. So it's D R S T E F like Frank E N I at the Masters Touch dot org. If you're so inclined to do it that way. <laughs> so um, also the Masters Touch H S at Cox dot net. That's my regular email. Masters Touch H S at Cox dot net. Poet at Cox dot net. P O E T at Cox dot net. Or the letter M, the letter T, the letter H, the letter S. The word prayer at cox.net. So it's M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. I want to invite you to join uh, Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself every Monday on Spreaker.com at 10 a.m. Pacific Time for Living the Word. Now, this is a program that teaches you how to apply the Word and promises of God to your life today, in everyday life. So come join us on Mondays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time on Spreaker.com and come expecting to receive. That program follows this one, so stay tuned. My friends, remember Proverbs 4, verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. And that's exactly what we're doing here, dear ones. We are gaining God's wisdom. So be sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. You know, the Master's Touch Masterclass is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. 
Now, I will see you again here in the master's class on Tuesday, tomorrow, at 10 a.m. Today it's at 9 a.m. Tomorrow is 2, 10 a.m. Um, and I'll see you in just a little while at 10 o'clock Pacific time right here on Spreaker.com for uh, Living the Word. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow or a little bit later on.